Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Channel 781 News Waltham City Council debrief. Uh, this week in the City Council, the mayor asked uh, for money um, to uh, restore the rail trail, um, and that was sent to committee. Uh, Councillor Durkee introduced a resolution having to do with single family homes and clarifying the number of people who can live in a single family home. Councillor Harris introduced a resolution having to do with blackouts and electricity in a particular part of Moody Street. And the mayor asked the city council to approve her using $6 million of ARPA funds that was also sent to committee. Um, so we'll talk a little, give you a little bit more background on each of those. I'm here with Chris Gamble. Hello, everyone. And James Creek Hallies. Hi, everyone. And starting off, we'll start off with the rail trail because that's a fun topic. I'm excited about that. So for those who don't know, the rail trail is there's an old railroad track that runs all the way from Weston to Watertown across Waltham. And some parts of it are fixed up as a walking trail and some parts of it are a mess. But if it were to all be fixed up, it would be a really great place to walk or ride your bike because it goes all the way across Waltham. It goes to Market Basket so people could even use it to get their groceries. And um, the prospect of fixing it up has been discussed for a while. So Chris, can you tell us a little more about that? Yes. So the rail trail has been talked about for many, many years. Um, I'm trying to pull up a map of it right now. Um, but it's, it's something that people thought was going to be done years ago. Um, I ran for city council last year and something that came up um, often in Ward Five because uh, it is included there, is twice more than more than once. Um, someone at the door was talking about the rail trail, and they were like, "Yeah, I can't believe that like that didn't happen. I can't believe that that was like shut down." And I had to remind them, I was like, "Oh no, that's still going on. Like it's going to happen. Um, it's just going to take a lot longer." And um, Catherine Cagle in the planning department, she's really spearheading the whole thing. Um, and she comes into the city council, so we should chat sometimes. And this is something that I'm really looking forward to, so we chat about that. And yeah, I mean, like, I'm always like, what can you tell me about the timeline for the rail trail? And she always says like, I'm done, I'm done guessing. Like, I'm done, I used to, I put many dates on it and I'm just no, no longer doing that. Uh, but it's gonna happen and it's gonna, it's gonna be really nice. I'm looking forward to it. Is the amount of time it's taking, is that just because of, is that just standard for the way we do things in Waltham or is there something particular with this project that's making it uh, take longer? Oh, I wish I wish we had Catherine here to talk about that. Um, Cause I think, yeah, other cities have started their process. They're farther ahead than us. So I can't answer why that exactly is. I would be interested to know the answer. Oh yeah, that's an aspect of it I should have mentioned is that it connects to other cities who are also huge, fixing yeah. it up. So it could be a really huge multi-city uh, yeah. trail, which would be nice. So they, she asked for the money, they sent it to committee. So that's a step forward. The next thing we need to talk about is the resolution that was submitted by Councillor Durkee. Um, it was submitted by him, but actually all of the councillors, I believe, signed on to it, except for Councillor Paz and Councillor Stanley. Um, were the only ones who did not. It didn't say that in the, the handout packet, but that's what I uh, wrote down after watching the meeting. Um, James, can you tell us a little bit more about what this resolution is and, and what it's supposed to do? Um, I think I think Darcy didn't sign on to it either. As, as ah, the okay. okay. And uh, the, in, the, in bringing this up, uh, Derby, uh, referenced an example of a residentially zoned area where there was a, I guess, an example of a four bedroom house that had been turned into a six bedroom and then uh, advertised to rent for up to 12 people or get advertised as a property that would then get rented, I guess, up to 12 people. And then uh, was bringing up the, uh, wanting to bring in the, uh, the, the solicitor to talk about, I guess, like how to, uh, legally go about uh i guess enforcing the single family like zoning and it being for like only up to i think for like one like, related family whereas like other properties once you get above uh, three unrelated people i guess it's like a rooming house and like, i'm not entirely clear on like those distinctions or how that breaks down but I guess the, they're bringing in the, the solicitor to talk about this publicly. We have to assume that they're going to be doing something about that. They try to like 
address enforcement of the existing zoning laws. And I guess where that goes is up to speculation. Thanks, thanks. I actually have a, a slide here. I'll share my, my screen. While you're sharing the screen, James, should we abolish single family zoning and why is the answer yes? Uh, it's massively inefficient just from a uh, resource allocation and like just like general maintenance costs like because you have to maintain gas roads and everything to everyone's house or not to go off on a tangent that's not a tangent no that's an important background so uh there's a wide range of opinions about single family housing in waltham certainly um what i pulled up here is the code and if i'm trying to understand um so okay. councillor durkee thinks that there's something ambiguous here so a single family home is defined as a home for a single family but there's no definition of a family there's no maximum number of people and then a rooming house has four or more people who are not related and it even specifies you know they can't the second degree of kinship so i believe what councillor durkee asked in the meeting is does that mean that four is the maximum number of pe unrelated people who can live in a single family home and i think the answer is no the code doesn't say that but i can see why he wants to clarify uh, that with the lawyer because there is a little bit of ambiguity here but what was it? One thing that was interesting about the resolution is that he said in it that the goal was to preserve the integrity of our single family housing. So we, I was wondering what he meant by integrity. So if, if um, you live in a single family home, single family neighborhood, and the people next door to you have more people in the house than you thought they would, um, why is that a problem? Is that a problem culturally because you just want to live in a single family neighborhood? or are the potential implications for that? So this actually caused us to look back at something that was said in the committee meetings last week, um, where the uh, assessor, when he was um, talking to the committee to be reappointed, he quickly gave a summary of where the taxes come from in Waltham. He said that it's about $190 million a year. And of that, a little over 40% comes from real estate taxes, which means residential property taxes. A little over 52% comes from commercial taxes and the rest comes from personal property, which means excise on cars and property that's not a house. Um, so we were curious also like how much comes, how much of this money comes from single family homes and how much of it comes from multifamily homes. Our, multi, our single families homes actually more valuable um, in terms of taxes than a multifamily home. And we found this plot, which comes from the presentation on taxes that was given to the city council back in November. So you can find this online. Um, and it shows the percentage of, but it interestingly, it shows that, it shows it by parcel. So it shows we have a lot more single family lots than we have other types of lots, but it doesn't actually show uh what percentage of our taxes they make up another thing that was interesting about this is this is for 2021 and then they also included it for 2011 and you can see this has barely changed at all in 10 years the percentage of single family homes is only gone down by less than a percentage point so if there are counselors who with what they mean preserve the integrity is that they want to have just as many single family homes in Waltham as they always have, they do seem to be doing a good job with that. They haven't allowed it to decrease very much over 10 years. Um, but going back to this, so commercial property is has double as tax at double the rate of residential property in Waltham. So that's part of the reason such a big um, percentage of our revenue comes from commercial. But in fact, residential property owners pay even less than that because there's something called an exemption and james i'm going to go to you can you explain how the residential exemption works so the residential exemption works by reducing your assessed home value at like at, a, at the high level so it reduces it by 35 percent you know if it's you know, 600,000, it reduces it by 35 percent of the 600,000, and you only get taxed on that smaller chunk and that effectively reduces property taxes for the people who own and live in that property. And there was a breakdown. It's something like 91% of homeowners in the city are direct beneficiaries of this and that they are below the break-even point for making more money from having, or 
benefiting more from having the residential exemption than not having it. Only the 9% or so most expensive properties are losing money, losing money as a result of having this. Uh, one other notable thing for the residential exemption that it's almost doubled in the last like five years because it, it was originally 20% and now it's up to 35%. And one of the reasons that they pointed out for that was uh, that they've been hoping to keep the tax burden the same for people that are homeowners while uh, spending the same amount on city services, attempting to sort of realize that out of the, the, the exemption increasing, but then the tax burden increasing on other things. Uh, one other thing I think is important to point out is that renters don't tend to get this benefit uh, because they aren't owner, owners occupying it and paying them like property taxes. And that those rising property taxes that are getting levied on their landlord are very often just can't pass through directly to the renters. How is the exemption set? The, the rate is just set by the council or is somehow based on it's revenue? Set, it's set by the, uh, by the city. And I don't recall actually exactly what sets that. I believe that it's, from reading it, it sounded like they were basically setting it based on what they needed to do to meet their budgetary like requirements for the year. I think that's something to look into where that exactly did, like what the process is for setting that. I know it has been increased year over so year. I guess, I guess what I'm trying to clarify is if if commercial tax revenue were to go down, oh. um, reducing that exemption would be one option for how they could make up yeah. for that. But that wouldn't happen automatically. They would have to uh, make the choice to, to reduce it. Is that right? Yeah, yeah that's, the knob, that's basically a knob that they would be able to then adjust in the future with the knock-on effect of having people realize that other oh, taxes are going up. So I'm sure that's a potential political football in the future for hot potato. I remember the city council, um, when they talked about the tax exemption, there were a couple of councilors. I don't know if they ever went public with it, so I'm not gonna, not gonna name them, but they were convinced that the residential tax exemption does lay the burden on to renters, uh, but I don't think they could ever prove it. And they actually brought a tax assessor in and someone asked that, they said, you know, does this burden lay on to renters? And the tax assessor had a very tax assessor answer about, you know, the homeowner, the landlord, um, taking other things into account when addressing when to raise their rents and not just this residential tax exemption, which I thought was just like a very cop-out answer. Um, but uh, I mean, it's, it all points to the landlords not getting this exemption, their price is going up. And if their prices go up, why would they foot the bill? They're gonna put the bill onto renters. Interesting, yeah. And, and uh, as most renters know, landlords raise the rent every year and often the the reason they give for why they need to do that is because their property taxes go up every year. So if there's this exemption that goes to homeowners but doesn't go to landlords, that definitely is getting passed on um, to the renter, or at least that's what our landlords want us to believe because they're telling us they're passing the taxes on to us. Before we move on to the other resolution, James, can I just ask, what, what do you think was the uh, motivation for Councillor Durkee and the other councillors bringing this up? Do you think um, it was really just in response to this one example of a house that was being sold for more people than usual, or do you think there's more behind this? I think that there are perfectly legitimate reasons to be uh, trying to make sure that development isn't happening in a way that's like not like you know is is unsustainable in the future you want to make sure that development's happening in a way that's like in accordance with some kind of city plan and like it's not a good thing to have people circumventing that however that's a charitable interpretation and there's also stuff coming down at the state level talking about how cities have to make it easier or more be more flexible about allowing multifamily zoning i have to imagine it's related to that okay interesting so uh, moving on to um, Councillor Harris's resolution. Chris, can you explain what her resolution was? So Kathy Ann Harris brought a late file communication into the city council. Um, so we can't actually show you uh, what, the, what, it, what it says, but uh, to summarize, Kathy Ann Harris is asking for 
National Grid, I believe, or it might be Eversource, a representative to come in to talk about the rolling blackouts that persist in Ward 8 um, on the bottom of Moody Street. Um, why the rolling blackouts persist there disproportionately to the um, other areas in, Wal in Waltham. So uh, that is essentially what, what they're asking. Is that unusual for a counselor to um, bring up an issue with a utility company in the council? And what, what's the benefit of doing that in the council? Well, I mean, Kathy Ann is doing what Kathy Ann was elected to do. Uh, she's hearing concerns from her constituents about these blackouts. He's been going on for years. Um, and this is some, this is part of her the tool belt of a counselor uh, to do this. Um, it's definitely uh, not something that normally happens. Uh, normally uh, things don't have to come to this where she calls out uh, companies specifically on the council floor and asks them to come in and address issues. But uh, it's, it's, we'll see if it's effective. Um, I think uh, a spoiler alert, the answer is money. I think clearly the money is the biggest issue here. Um, the the companies want to make money and this, they think that they can cut uh, South Side um, out of the bottom line. And uh, so I don't know if you guys have any other opinions about that, but I think that is what they will come and say. James, any thoughts on that? Uh, I mean, uh, there are like a fair amount of businesses on, in that part of the city. And I mean, it is reasonable to not, not want to have power outages. And especially because like it, it's, it, power is like the most obvious like like you, know, you can't you can't you can't work if you don't have any kind of electricity and stuff especially if you're working from home and there's a lot of people that would also potentially be working from home so that's a pretty big disruption so it, it strikes me as something that's worthwhile for them to at least be like applying whatever bully pulp that they had to sort of embarrass these companies into doing better you were asking about precedent setting this is actually not the first time this very specific issue got brought up at the city council i'm remembering in like 2019 um, maybe even 2018 um, this very issue was brought up uh, before i don't remember the uh resolution of it but i remember in committee joey lacava asking very similar questions about why these businesses are having almost no notice on blackouts that uh, occur on the southern south side. Um, so it's happened before. This is a issue that plagues Moody Street. Um, will anything change? Uh, we will see. Thank you. And the next thing you talk about is ARPA. Um, the mayor asked, uh, for permission to spend $6 million of Waltham's funds from ARPA, which is the federal program. And um, can you tell us more about that, Chris? So yes, the America Rescue Plan Act um, is essentially money that the government gives to municipalities to uh, help with the financial hardships that COVID has brought about. Um, so, Every city got a bunch of money and Waltham was no different. Waltham is different um, in the sense that we are not as transparent as some other cities and how to spend this money. I'm gonna share my screen. Josh, you might have to let me do that. This is, this is the communication from the city. It's saying we, it's saying the US treasury has outlined the use of these funds for the following four categories. And it lists these four categories, which is public health, replace, lost revenue in the public sector, um, investments in water, sewer, and broadband infrastructure, and premium pay for essential workers. That's great. They're saying that is what you're allowed to use the money for. And then in the city uh, communications at the bottom, it says the remaining grant funds will be used in accordance with these categories. But it, like, that's, like it's saying any of these things, we're going to use that money. And it, like you know that might be fine for some people, but it's not very transparent. There are some cities, and I've got Newton tagged right here. Um, all I had to do was look up Newton ARPA funds, and they have how they spent their money and the details, if I clicked on these, how to do that with dates listed. Um, it's great. I love this. This is awesome. Um, does Waltham have a list like this? If it does, then it's really hard to find because I couldn't find it. And is the city 
going to talk about this more in committee? Are they actually going to talk about where this money is being spent? Maybe, but it's just not transparent. It's not as transparent as other cities. It's not as transparent as we could be. Um, the city of Boston has an entire committee duh, looking at participatory budgets on, uh, on how to spend this money. Um, they're having public input on how to spend ARPA funds. And uh, this, this city of Waltham, the mayor's just like, yeah, well, we're just going to, we're going to use, we're going to follow the rules. That's essentially what you said. So I would like to see the city be way more transparent with how they spend this money. So that's all our topics for today. But I wanted to go back uh, again to the issue of Councillor Durkee's resolution about single family homes. And, you know, when I, when I was thinking about what James said about, you know, you need to, the, you need to, um, there are good reasons to want to clarify how this ordinance works. So when you look at it at the close up level, it, it, it totally makes sense. But when you step back, there were only a few issues discussed at this meeting. And one of them was too many people in a house. And this is happening at a time where we have a lot of people who have no house and we have a lot of people who are in danger of having no house. So I guess my question is, what does this say about our priorities and our, our attitudes about housing? And I'm going to go to you, James. I'm going to put you on the spot. It, I think it really shows where the priorities are that, in, you know, we've got, I, I, would, I, I wouldn't say unprecedented homeless crisis, but because it's been like this, it's just gotten worse. And the priority, I guess, goes towards how do we make sure that our single family homes are stick like maintaining the exact same number and having their value only go up forever doesn't strike me as something that's sustainable if it's if you're talking about like from a public policy standpoint these places um, it's pretty clear don't aren't, aren't long-term sustainable in terms of like they don't produce enough money to pay for their expenses and we keep trying to find ways to cut their taxes so they contribute even less so that's just more money getting transferred to maintaining single family homes while people are basically while a subset of people are then stuck living out of their cars or fighting for a handful of rental apartments that are way too expensive because they're subsidizing all of these single family homes it's... thank you thank when you I, yeah when i when i heard that news that this person's house was had 12 roommates i was thinking probably pretty cheap i you know i would find 11 friends and that would be not a bad price at all yeah, I mean, I don't know the story behind um, why this house was advertised this way, but, you know, if there's 12 people in a house, there's 12 people who need somewhere to live, and um, this resolution doesn't address that, really. It just addresses can they be there or not. So any final thoughts before we sign off? Chris? Nope. Thank you very much, Josh, for putting this all together. Anything else, James? And thanks for having us. And I think it would be good to talk more about taxes in the future. If anyone's interested, yes. you should probably reach out. Yes. Um, so yeah, so we'll be back next week to talk about the city council committee meetings, but we would like to talk more about uh, how taxes work and particularly the relationship between residential, different types of residential taxes. And so if you're an expert on that, get in touch because <laughs> we'd love to have you a guest. Or if you're not an expert, but you know of some good sources of information, send us some links. Uh, thank you very much. And we will see you next week. Thank you, everyone. Bye.